Um, and I'm going to share a little secret before I start. But the ideas that I'm going to sketch out here are a little undercooked. I haven't thought about them that hard or for that long. And I, I, I offer that quite deliberately because I think sometimes an idea or a design proposition is at its most elegant when it hasn't been messed around with too much. Okay, it's most it's at its most fertile. So you might find some flaws in this proposition, and I'd be happy to sh um, to discuss them as we go through um, the, the sessions later today. Um, but I hope also what you can see is if you, if you're willing to um, take on board the, the premise of these ideas, you, you might see the potential of how we could we could transform this city and other cities. Um, now, going on in the background here is. Um, is a, a case for why we need to do this. And in a, in a way, this slide's a bit redundant anyway, because we've kind of seen, we've heard this this morning, we've, we've heard that backdrop of why cities are complex and changing and, and difficult and so on. Um, there was one point on that last slide um, around the end of the demographic dividend that I wanted to touch on. And that's a, a, a phrase that um, Professor Graham Hugo coined, which points to the moment which is coming very quickly in Australia, about 2014, where the proportion of our population that is productively working um, won't be as big as it has been for the, the last generation. What does that mean? It means that governments um, won't and can't uh, be able to deliver the kind of capital works and transformations of our cities the way we might have expected them to, to do in the past. So um, in parallel with that, we, we've already kind of seen an emergence of, of <coughs> an energy and appetite towards being involved more actively in that as citizens with this kind of DIY urbanism. And, and some of these guerrilla activities and things like Parking Day have now become almost mainstream and, and are really well supported by our, our local and state governments. Um, uh, there are other things like Splash, uh, which are being actively led and delivered by, um, by our authorities, but done in a way with a kind of light touch that gives people opportunities to do things themselves. You're seeing all the exciting bits coming. <laughs> coming <laughs> um, so, having said that, there is really good work going on, but I think this image here still characterises much of, of, um, of, our, of our kind of governance and, and uh, uh, cities today, where the kind of regulation and, and um, parameters that we have to work with uh, sometimes have lost sight of what we're really trying to do. They're disproportionate and, and at worst they're obstructive, at best they're just annoying. So um, <laughs> I, 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 I'm talking very generally as I make this day. Oh, this is going crazy. So um, the question then is how can a more creative approach to policy transform our contemporary cities? And I'm borrowing uh, a, a wonderful anecdote from Charles Landry here, the curious, my terms, the curious case of the Calgary um, bike bells, where in Calgary they have this extensive network of shared bike and pedestrian paths, um, and they administer a $57 fine if you don't have a bell on your bike. Um, it costs $100 to administer that. People ride away very angry, still with no bell, zero <laughs> compliance, it's an angry customer, it's a, um, a dissatisfied employee. So they tried something different. For that $100, they bought 100 bells at a dollar each and gave each inspector a, a screwdriver and some bells. <laughs> they offered people the choice then of a fine or a bell. Now everyone took the bell, they got full compliance, they had happy citizens and, and a, a satisfied employee. So um, Landry, I need to dwell on this one for a moment. Landry makes the point there that with financial capital, the more you use it, the less you have with social capital, those positive transactions between the inspector and the cyclist. <laughs> Go with that one. Um, the more social, the more you use social capital, the more it achieves. So that's a really important distinction. So against that backdrop, I'm wondering then how could creative, a creative approach to policy transform Adelaide? That was the second thing I thought when I got this fucking parking fine. <laughs> um, the first thing I thought was more probably the feeling that most of you have felt, um, and almost universally, there's this kind of hostility towards these. Well, something's going on. Um, hostility towards these poor buggers who have to administer those kind of punitive um, um, policies. So um, now it's a universal condition, but it's one that's felt very directly in Adelaide. We have 42,700 car parks. Believe it or not, that's $12 million a year of revenue just in the fines, not the parking meters, and a staggering 235,000 people that are affected by that every year. And we hear quite often, let's pause on that one if I can, we hear quite often that the sort of frustration that it's revenue raising <laughs> and so on. Now, I think revenue is fine, it means you can do things, but when you receive that parking fine, you feel so disconnected from <coughs> the, the value that that revenue might bring in transforming the city. So 
I'm wondering how the parking fine, the experience of that, can more directly contribute, more transparently contribute towards delivering on some of the good strategic intentions that we see in things like the integrated movement strategy or, or whatever. So we need to rethink. My sketch that I'm going to offer you now is can we rethink the parking inspector? Instead of issuing one of these, maybe we can issue one of these. You can have the choice. You can take the fine if you want. Um, and so we, we undertake this process of transforming the city through these little micro-interventions where we transform a car space, put down some basic infrastructure of a, of a, um, a parklet tray with a reservoir. You plant your fine into that. Um, in time, 50, 50 fines later, we have a parklet, and that starts to mature and form a network through the city. Um, now, the beauty in this proposal I dare say, is that it's, a, it's an accelerating system, it's an exponential system, where the more fines, the more parklets, the less car parks. So you're more likely to get more fines, which will give you more parklets, and you're off. <laughs> so, so in a week, we might see one, one parklet. In a year, we might see a 1,000 parklets that 5,000 people have helped shape. In five years, that might be a 1,000 parklets with 50,000 50, people involved in creating those little parklets. Um, now, how it transforms the city, I think that in some ways it doesn't really matter. It could be just peppered across the city. It could be a strategic move to connect the park or connect the squares, or it could be the whole lot. It doesn't really matter. Um, that can come in time. So, uh, the byproduct of this, other than greeting the city and, and creating those streets for people, is this kind of you know, civic pride that, that we see in things like, you know, SA Million Trees program and so on. Um, it involves rethinking the role of what an inspector is and thinking of them perhaps as a curator with a mobile dispensary of seedlings. It also involves rethinking what um, a perpetrator might be and thinking of them instead as a place shaper. Uh, and that's something we should celebrate, that, 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 that active participation in shaping the city. And we can make that very visual. We can tap into the networks, the data flows, and we can celebrate that contribution on the infrastructure we already have. So in summary, we deliver 1,000 parklets with 50,000 place shapers, empowered stuff. I'm not sure if it's no cost to the city, but it can't be much. So what could possibly go wrong? Thank you. <laughs>